As we continue our look at the way of discipleship, what it means to follow Jesus, we turn to a story from Luke's Gospel. This story takes place just after Jesus has celebrated His last supper with His friends and shortly before Jesus would be arrested. Let us listen together for God's Word. A dispute also arose among them as to which one of them was to be regarded as the greatest. But Jesus said to them, The kings of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those in authority over them are called benefactors. But not so with you. Rather, the greatest among you must become like the youngest, and the leader like one who serves. For who is greater, the one who is at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one at the table? But I am among you, as one who serves. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. God, we desire to be your faithful servants. Speak to us this morning by the power of your Spirit so that we might know how best to serve you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. One of the first times I can remember as a preteen being brand conscious was shortly after my family moved from Southern California to West Michigan. In Southern California, the cool brands that kids wear, they're connected to things like surfing and skateboarding, uh, but in Michigan, they're connected to not freezing to death. So when we arrived, uh, I discovered a whole new ecosystem of clothing brands that, that I was completely unfamiliar with. And As that first fall came along, none of us had winter coats, we didn't have gloves, we didn't have snow pants, we had nothing. So we went out, the whole family, all five of us, into an outdoor clothing store, well an indoor store, but it had outdoor stuff in it, and um, we, uh, we just had to buy everything. So we go in and I know exactly what I'm looking for. I'm looking for those brands that I've seen. Uh, on my my classmates that I've seen them wearing and I I go to those racks and my jaw drops when I see the price tag. I'm 12, 13 years old and not really all that concerned about you know money Uh, but even even for me that was that was a lot of money for these nice coats that seemed like everybody had so I had to settle for a lower a lower brand a lesser status to uh, to wear uh, among my middle school peers. In, in the world of economics, there is a basic inviolable or almost inviolable principle, and that is this, that as the price goes up, the demand goes down. It makes good sense. As things get more expensive, fewer people want to or are capable of buying them. But there is one particular kind of good that is the exception that proves the rule, and it's called, I'm going to have to look at this, a Veblen Good. I'm sure that's named after some economist somewhere who wrote a paper about this. A Veblen good is a good that defies this basic law of economics, where the price goes up with a Veblen good, the demand also goes up. And the Veblen good is a luxury good. It's an item that becomes that, that, that is, is in higher demand because the price goes up. And the only reason that the economics of this works backwards is because of us, because of how we function, how we see the world, because we have a higher demand for something that seems to, uh, uh, that's more expensive, perhaps a little more special, that would elevate our status. It is this backwards logic that is planted in each of us that allows this law of economics to work backwards. It's not so much a word of judgment on us as it is a statement of reality. This is what it is to be a human being. Look at the disciples in this story from Luke's Gospel. A scene that would be comic if it weren't so deadly serious. This is the Last Supper. Jesus is with His disciples on that Thursday night. The last time that He will eat with His friends. The last time that they will eat with their teacher, Jesus has just said to them at that table, this is my body given for you. He says to them, this cup that is poured out for you is the covenant in my blood. Jesus then goes on to predict that someone at that table will betray him. 
And Jesus alludes to his own death. He says that the one who betrays me is with me. And his hand is on the table for the Son of Man is going as it has been determined. But woe to the one by whom he is betrayed. So in the deadly seriousness of that moment, the disciples begin to discuss with one another who it will be that will betray them. And then, immediately following that, a dispute also arose among them as to which was to be regarded as the greatest. At this point, Jesus rolls his eyes, he throws up his hands, and he says, you people are impossible. This might have been excusable for the disciples at the beginning of of Jesus' ministry when they were all still rough around the edges. They hadn't really had the time it takes to figure out exactly what Jesus' program is. And now here they are on the eve of his death, bickering with each other about who is going to be regarded as the greatest. These men, these disciples had followed Jesus, they had listened to Him, and they are acting like absolute knuckleheads, having an argument over who's the more important one, while Jesus is trying to tell them that the end, His end, is near. These disciples, like like me as a 13-year-old shopping for a winter coat, like all of us in almost every aspect of our lives, these disciples are inclined toward concerns of status. They care deeply about their status. To the point that even Jesus becomes a means to that end. Even the ministry of Jesus, even as He's speaking about His death, as as His uh, prediction of His own betrayal is still echoing in the room, even then they are concerned about how they're going to benefit when all of this is said and done. And this behavior deserves a mini lecture from Jesus. One final exasperated sermon to his incorrigible disciples. He says, the kings of the Gentiles lord it over them. And those in authority over them are called benefactors. But not so with you. Rather, the greatest among you must become like the youngest. And the leader like one who serves. These are familiar words. We've heard these words from Jesus before. In fact, just a couple of weeks ago, when I was speaking about sacrifice, I used similar words from Matthew's Gospel where Jesus says the the first will be last and the last will be first. Because they're familiar, the, the shock of these words is lost on us. But this is a really radical idea. That someone who is in power would choose instead to serve. In 2001, the author Jim Collins wrote the book Good to Great, a book uh, about business leadership. And it was wildly successful, but not just in the business world, it was also really popular in, in the church. This was the kind of book that pastors were reading and sharing and talking a lot about. And the reason is because Collins, um, he lists seven characteristics of companies that make the transition from good to great companies. And at the top of that list is Humble leadership. Humble leadership. To which pastors, of course, said, yes, that's what we've been talking about all this time. That's what Jesus said. See, even the business world recognizes that humility is important. Humble leadership. The idea that Jesus is presenting when He tells His disciples that if they want to be the greatest, they must serve it's even more radical than the idea of of an executive of a Fortune 500 company being humble. A radical idea to be sure. Jesus is, is beginning to expose to the disciples, to us, the ways that status inflects every little thing that we do as human beings. They're sitting around a table. They're having dinner. And so Jesus uses this moment, uses that place and the dynamics of table fellowship to help them begin to see the way that even there, in that most ordinary place, status is at play. He says to them, who is greater? The one who is at the table or the one who serves? If they had been walking down the street of a market... He would have said, who is greater, the one who eats the produce or the one who sells it? If they'd been in the countryside of Galilee where much of Jesus' ministry took place, He would say, who is greater, the one who owns the field or the one who works it? 
If Jesus were with us today, He would say, who is greater? The one who rents the hotel room or the one who cleans it? Who is greater? The one who drives the car or the one who repairs it? The one who lives under the roof or the one who fixes it? The one who uses the phone or the one who assembles it? The one who wears the clothes or the one who sews them? We know the answers to these questions. We know who is greater in that equation because we understand how status works. We understand it intuitively. Status functions like this implicitly around us all the time. And because it's everywhere and because it's a part of who we are, it's a part of our human nature, we rarely notice it. Jesus is trying to shine a light on our preoccupation with status. The service that Jesus is speaking of is more than humility. It's more than taking a, a, humble, uh, a humble attitude in our interactions with others. It's an intentional subverting of the, the many little ways that status plays in our lives. It's turning the table so that our life is no longer about self-fulfillment, but instead it becomes about self-emptying for the sake of others. That is the radical idea here. It's not just about an attitude. It's about a, complete, uh, a completely different disposition through life. And we're going to celebrate communion this morning. I, I've never quite thought of, of communion in this way until I was uh, thinking about this text and preparing this sermon. But look at how Jesus chooses to be remembered. As we gather around this table, we hear those words of Jesus. Do this in remembrance of of me. But I've never really thought that this is how Jesus has chosen to be remembered. It's not an accident. Jesus knew that his end was near. He knew that his life would be taken. He knew that his disciples would have to carry on without him, that there would be some sort of legacy that he was leaving behind, some sort of movement that would carry on after him. So surely he gave some thought to how how he would be remembered, how that legacy would be lived out and carried on. He could have chosen to go out in a blaze of glory with some great uprising or demonstration to the authorities of Rome, something to really light the fires of revolution. Or at the very least, he could have made it a steak dinner, something fancy. But instead, he chooses the most common elements. Bread, wine, Staples of the most simple, the poorest meal. Broken, spilled, given, empty. Do this in remembrance of me. This is how I want to be remembered. Eat this meal in remembrance of me. And, and, give yourself in remembrance of me. Empty yourself out. Pour yourself out in remembrance of me. And whenever we hear Jesus speaking of service, we should keep in mind the words of the prophet Isaiah. There are several passages throughout Isaiah that from the very beginning of the church they recognized as, as uh, alluding to or pointing to Jesus. They're called the servant song. Some of them we turn to on Good Friday every year. And this is one of them. He will not cry or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break. And a dimly burning wick he will not quench. He will not grow faint or be crushed until he has established justice in the earth. Jesus did not assert his right to be heard. His right to self fulfillment in life, his importance, his status, the status that he likely deserved as the Son of God, as a great teacher, as a healer, as a worker of miracles. Instead, he was a dimly burning wick. But it hasn't yet gone out. To this day, it still burns. The call to discipleship, the call to follow Jesus, is the call to imitate Christ. To replicate Him in our lives. To serve the way that He did. To become a servant. To become a slave the way that Jesus did. 
to acknowledge those impulses that are deep within us, that make us preoccupied with status, with greatness, with importance, with how we measure up to the rest of the world around us, and it allows them to be turned upside down. It's difficult to imitate Jesus. Call that the understatement of the year. It's no easy thing to decide that with my life, I'm going to replicate the kind of life that Jesus lived to show others the kind of heart that Jesus had, the kind of love that Jesus lived. It's no easy thing to imitate Jesus. And we, the knuckleheads, we have known Jesus for a long time. Many of us have been coming to church for our entire lives, hearing the story of the gospel over and over. I certainly fit into the knucklehead category. And we still, we still don't quite get it. We still cling to status. We still search for importance and greatness and allow our lives to be oriented around that pursuit rather than the pursuit of Jesus. And so... Because we don't get it, because we are slow to catch on, we gather around this table again. We allow ourselves to be served by Jesus as we share simple bread that is given, simple drink that is poured out, reminding us to give ourselves for others to pour ourselves out for others, to serve as Christ served. Let us pray. God, in Christ you have given yourself fully for us. May we give ourselves fully for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.